My name is Carlos from Steven Slay Audio. Uh, greetings uh, and a warm welcome to the Trigger 2 live stream hosted by Grammy Award winning producer, our close friend, uh, producer and engineer, Greasy Will. Greasy is going to walk us through how he utilized Trigger 2 on Killer Mike's album, Michael. Uh, and it's truly exciting to have all of you here with us today. And we can't wait to, to get everything started. So just I'm going to say this a couple of times. Cause I want to make sure everybody gets it uh, for everyone here today. Uh, Trigger 2 has been cut down uh, by 20% down to $99. And we'll be dropping the discount code in the chat periodically for everyone to take advantage of it. Uh, just informing everyone here that we are live. This is fully live, not pre-recorded. Just in the unlikely event of any minor artifacts or delays, which we don't expect at all. But I want to make sure I mention that. Additionally, I'd like to mention that this event is going to be recorded for everyone who couldn't join us live today or if you have to hop off early. Uh, so rest assured, and we'll be sending out a link to the complete video of today's session over the next few days. So if you miss anything during the live stream, like I said, don't worry. You'll have the opportunity to catch up and rewatch at your own convenience. Uh, and a quick thing about the comments in the Q&A we're going to be doing at closing with Greasy. Um, I want to address that uh, due to the high number of attendees, everyone's audio will be muted. Uh, but feel free to ask any questions you have by using the chat feature uh, via Vimeo with your name to participate. It's easy. You don't have to sign up. Just a quick name. We'll do the trick. Uh, towards the end of the session, I'll be passing those questions that you ask in the chat over to Greasy. Uh, so make sure you stick around to hear his insights and responses. And again, just one more time so everyone can get it. Uh, for those who haven't yet got Trigger 2, now is the excellent opportunity. Like I said, we're currently offering Trigger 2 at that 20% discount, and that's going to run until March 31st, so the end of the week. This software includes all the features that Greasy will be showcasing today, and I'll also be sharing it again uh, as a discount code in the chat throughout the stream. And also, one special thing we're also doing is don't forget to stick around to the end after the Q&A. We'll be previewing previewing trigger three and also our ssd groove ai as well which are crazy you know we, we showed those at nam and people lost their minds so can't wait to show it again here uh, and without further ado let's dive right in greasy the man of the hour take it over all right all right so uh this is going to be higher def than most of you are used to seeing me if you don't know who i am i am greasy will and i am stuck on my own cable uh, I'm Greasy Will. Uh, I have been doing this as an engineer for about 15 years, and I started actually right here in the building we're in today, which is East West. Prior to that, I went to school at the Conservatory of Recording Arts and Sciences in uh, Phoenix, and before that, I played in bands. I didn't know anything about engineering. So when I came into the audio world, I literally went, no knowledge, school, here the biggest records in the world being made around me literally i on my day of the interview i got introduced to the chili peppers who were working in studio two on a record so uh i got dropped right into the hot water and i had to figure out a lot of things really really fast so um as we said uh, uh i am you know uh the engineer and i produced on a few tracks for uh killer mike's most recent grammy award winning album michael uh it started off as a project that mike had been working on in atlanta he came out to la we worked together one time and he was like i need to work with you for everything so we just started doing everything from there i worked on every single song as an engineer i produced a song uh on the deluxe with um two of my friends obi and uh travagant and um we're super proud of that it was a lot of really cool stuff and then also throughout the entire process there was a lot of producing that happens as an engineer it's a very tricky place to be as an engineer sometimes to be in those positions because you have to make decisions and you have to come up with ideas that uh, don't influence the actual production, but still make the songs the way they should be. So to start off today, uh, I'm going to show uh, mostly some hip hop, hip hop applications, but I wanted to show the traditional use, but how I use it in a slightly different way. And everything that you see today, you might have seen before, but you've never seen it like this, because there's a lot of ways to use Trigger as a uh, as a corrective software, as an additive software. There's so many cool little things that outside of just, hey, I, I, I sampled this kick and put it in here. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, the first thing I have is a, uh, a, a drum recording that I did about two weeks ago for an artist. And uh, 
it was a really fast paced thing. We were working in a studio while they were doing video as well. And we had to record multiple takes of the song. And we had another artist coming in and the drummer was singing at the same time. And the video crew, unfortunately, kept having little accidents that happened. They unplugged mics. They accidentally uh, shut off power supplies for things like video crews are tough to work around. So all that to say, at the end of the day, when I went to open up these tracks and the specific take that they wanted to use was uh, it, it had some issues. And the biggest issue was that somehow during this process, the snare drum that we had uh, recorded, it was getting bumped by something throughout the track. And I didn't hear it whenever we were listening to it. It only happened on the one take that I specifically needed it to not happen on. So it was just a disaster for that. But Fortunately, there's some really cool features that I could take advantage of with Slate, with uh, the Trigger 2, that, that helped me solve this problem. So let's just jump right into it. Let's put this cool little mic stand over here. Hopefully uh, it'll work out. All right, so I'm going to start off. This is the drum track, and I'll play it for you as a whole. Uh, Now, most of you probably listening on computer speakers or on headphones, you might barely even hear it as a whole. And this is what I was going through too, which is even when it was there, it's not a problem that I specifically noticed. But as soon as you solo up that snare, you'll hear what I'm talking about. you'll hear this little like, it sounds like something was grinding against the microphone. And I think that's exactly what was happening, but there's no way for me to know because like I said, it was just the, it was the, the situation. There was a lot of moving parts. We were moving really fast and there's this weird little rubbing noise here. I'll solo it up and loop it so we can. It almost sounds like air being blown on the capsule or something, which as a whole, was not an easily solvable issue. The biggest issue with it was that it wasn't happening in a gateable situation. In a normal uh, instance where some noise is happening, I'd just say, yeah, screw it, just gate it. It's not a big deal. But this was happening during the snare getting hit. It was happening when it wasn't getting hit. And the gate just wasn't solving the problem. Now, the next answer is short of going through and trying to cut out every single time it happens or figuring out a way to like do it. There wasn't a great answer for how to solve this. But the answer I came up with was I found a time in this track where the snare happens all by itself. So I have this one single snare hit that nothing is happening during it. And I took this original snare track that I have right here and all I did was I tabbed a transient so I could get the cleanest, best version of this signal. And um, in this situation, I actually did take a little bit off the top as well. So I found this and then I took this and I just applied a slight fade to the end so that I didn't have to worry about anything happening and I consolidated that track. Now, all I'm gonna do is very simply export this to my trigger library which in this situation is on my drive. We'll go to Slate, Trigger 2 Library. And I just dropped it right in here. I named it something originally, but no, nah, we'll just leave it Snare Top 23. I don't care, it's not that big of a deal. And exported it. Now I'm gonna go, and again, this is like a traditional use of, of Trigger 2, where you would load a sample in to replace the snare that you have. But in this situation, I'm using the exact same snare. Now, the advantage to doing this is obviously it's going to match the kit. It's going to sound exactly the way that she played it originally. But it's going to include all of my dynamics. It's going to be phase cohesive to the snares that were already there. And I'll show all that in a second. So uh, I go in here to, to trigger two. Now, I have, for the sake of simplicity, uh, organized some of these things and made it so that I don't have to go through and re, uh, recheck all my settings, but there is an important setting that I'll talk about in a second. 
So I'm gonna come in here, we'll just use this one. This is the one I just exported. And I'm just gonna drop that right in my snare. Go back to my triggering. Now, whenever I put this in with the overheads, it sounds, and should, because it's the exact same one, sounds exactly like the snare that was there, because it is the snare that was there. And you can even see right here where this snare is chopping off it's excluding all that noise. Now, I could have used the gate in here as well. There's a lot of ways to skin a cat when it comes to this stuff. The reason that this is like this is because I find the fastest and simplest ways. Because when you're working on six tracks that you've recorded in a day, there's not a lot of time to be like playing around with settings, and which is really cool about this because I don't have to play around with settings. It is as simple as just dropping it in and replacing it with the whole kit. Now, that setting that I was talking about, or not that setting, is in here in this view curves thing. Now, something that you're going to want to always check out is this dynamics and velocity buttons. These are kind of important because whenever these are selected, you can actually affect the dynamics and the velocity of that snare. And I wanted that dynamics to match what is originally there. And I'll show you how accurate that is. I'm gonna commit this track so we can look at it visually and put it right beside the one that was there. Now, you can see all of this noise is gone. The snare is still doing exactly what it was doing before because I'm using the exact same snare. It's phase cohesive. It's acting exactly the way that the original was. So it's not screwing up any of my uh, settings that I have for phase, any of the times I flipped phase to make it sound better. It's all gonna be the exact same as the original. And you can see it's literally lining up perfectly with the original snare. So this is a more traditional use of it. And you can see here, this is a great example too. Like you can see here, all of my dynamics are matching the original snare's dynamics which is really important because you don't want that sample to come in full force every single time. You want it to match up to what's there. All right, so this is a traditional example. Now I'm gonna move over to some of the more hip hop stuff that I've done and specifically things that I developed to solve problems while we were working on Killer Mike's record. Over here. Now for this track that I'm pulling up, this is um, something that I've done myself uh, just for, uh, you know, copyright issues and everything to make it so that we can put this everywhere and everybody can hear it. Uh, this is just a sample track that I put together. Keep in mind, uh, some of these examples have been uh, exaggerated for the sake of showing you exactly what's going on. But, um, but for the most part, this is the type of things that I was dealing with with Mike's record. So... In this song, I have just a simple drum loop, right? And then a bass, guitar, and uh, a hat sample that I'm gonna play later, but not right now. So this is what the track sounds like originally. Oh, that snare roll isn't there, just ignore that, but we'll get to that in a second. All right, so with this drum loop that I have, this is something that traditionally comes, especially with older cats, like No ID is a really good producer. He's got brilliant ways of doing things. But one thing that is really important to him is like, you don't get a drum loop sample from No ID and then quantize it. That's just not how it works. You leave that feel that's there. And if you were to look at this drum sample, I did exactly that. If you were to get this down so you can see the grid, uh, you're looking at things are ahead of the, the grid here, here. Things are back on the grid here. This one's a little behind the grid. That's the hat. This is a, uh, you know, there's all sorts of different flex and push and pull in this, in this drum loop. And the normal person might think, yeah, I'll quantize that, you know. But there's certain people out there, like, for example, um, um, 
oh god i'm gonna forget his name now but there's this producer this canadian producer which for whatever reason i'm forgetting his name right now but he uh purposely puts his stuff off the grid all the time uh and even like pharrell will talk about that when pharrell does like hi-hats pharrell will put the one on the grid but the rest of it he wants it to feel like it's moving and flexing and it has like a real vibe to it so if you were to go through in your traditional way like this is what a lot of people would do they would say okay i want to fatten up this this drum loop that exists So they would go through and they would find a sample that they like. In this case, I'm using a sample that I know I'm I'm going to like eventually. Uh, and it sounds like this. It's just a, a fat, fat kick drum, right? It's literally called fat kick drum. Now, your standard producer would take a look at this and they'd be like, oh, okay, cool. So just throw it on the grid and start putting it out there. And this is what I've done in the past as well. And this is not the answer, but I'm going to show it to you just so you know what the answer does look like eventually. All right. Now, if I were to do this and just quickly, I'm on somebody else's computer, so bear with me. Sometimes controllers are slow. Um, all right. So I've got this kick drum now, and I've just put it on the same pattern as the kick that's there. So the first issue is you'll hear it. It's not on the grid. So just throwing it to the grid is going to cause these flams where they don't hit at the same time. You can hear it. It's, you know, like it's not hitting at the exact same time. Now, most people would tell you that the answer is that, especially in Pro Tools, the answer is tab to transient, which I'll show you that real quick. It's, it's a fairly reasonably fast process, but you're going to tab and then you're going to paste it, and then you're going to go back to the original track, and then you're going to tab again, and you're going to paste it. Actually, that's a snare. Sorry, I'm lying. Then you're going to go to the next one, and you're going to paste it. And then you're going to go to the next one, and you're going to paste it. And then you're going to go to the next one. I'm going to very quickly do the rest of this so that you can see it. Now, your kicks are going to line up now. Cool. That's great. Obviously, once it gets to the end, it's not doing it anymore. But in the original, it's great. It's lining up. Cool. Problem solved. Let's move on. Let's do it. Now, the problem with this, to me, is that there is dynamics in this original drum loop that do not exist anymore in my replaced loop. So if I were to just play this, we're just hearing one velocity, one... one uh, 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 dynamic of this kick drum and that to me it's just not good enough I want to match this original kick drum loop or this original drum loop so that it feels live and it feels like the original does but I want to fatten it up so this is what I'm gonna do I'm gonna take this same loop and I'll just duplicate it for the time being because it's probably the easiest way to do this all right, let's get rid of this fat kick drum. And then for here, I'm just going to go through. I don't have to do all of this, but anything that is going to cause me problems, anytime that snare happens, I'm going to just chop it out real quick. And I'm doing the same thing that I would do with a regular uh, situation where I'm tabbing the transient and chopping the loop out. And then I'll, oops, tab transient. And I'll just chop it up. I don't even have to be that delicate with it because Trigger is going to do all the work here. Now I'm going to load up Trigger. And I'm going to get that same drum sample. Now I keep all of my own drum samples in Trigger usually because I, I tend to like my own stuff. I record a lot of drums. I produce a lot of stuff. I bring a lot of, I save a lot of stuff that I think is really cool. And I keep folders of stuff that I might want to add into a production. And something that I do a lot of times is even when I'm using live drums and I'm trying to supplement a live drum recording, I might add a programmed kick drum into that same um, like kick drum so that I have something that doesn't quite feel live, but doesn't feel like it's a programmed drum either. So in this situation, I'm gonna to go to that uh, 
my kick. I'm going to find that fat kick. It's right here. Turn my audition on, make sure it's the right one. Yep. And I'm going to load that up just like I normally do. Go over to my triggering. And now, not only have I replaced it with the original, but it's going to be phase cohesive each time. I'm not guessing on the way that it's going out. It is going to line up to that original kick drum in the same way every single time. But it's also going to maintain those dynamics that I care about in these things, right? And I'm, I'm gonna show that to you in a second. So now here's my drum loop. Uh, fly this over because it's the same thing twice. Something is weird. Let's find out why. Oh, it's probably because I didn't change my, look at my other. Watch my snare. I'm gonna bring my original back because it'll make it a lot easier. That way I don't have to set, play with my settings. Now, again, there is settings, and I purposely did this to not have to do this, but there is settings that you're gonna have to play with sometimes to get your stuff right. But in this case, I'm gonna go ahead and just use the one that I already created because it makes it easier. And, yeah. And I'm missing my kick drum, so I'm gonna have to get that real quick. Browser, kick, fat, throw that in there. Now, the settings that I'm talking about is narrowing down the sensitivity, the re-trigger, the detail, all that stuff to make it sit exactly in the pocket. I spent the time earlier to double check and make sure that this was right, but just so you know, I'm not cheating, I'm just lazy. Now, to show you this again, we're gonna commit this and leave it there so I can show the original. And you can see on this, we've maintained these dynamics that are so important. You know, and again, we're getting a phase cohesive kick, which is really important. And it's timed correctly to line up to these original kick drums. And that's the type of thing that you can spend so much time inching things back and forth to try and get it perfect. Or you can just load the sample up and call it a day. So now I have this new kick. And I like this. But here's another thing that I faced whenever I was doing Michael, which is uh, sometimes we'd have this drum loop and everybody likes it, but they're like, hey, we need to change like the, the, the dynamics of the song so that this drum loop comes in every now and then, but most of the time it's actually just... Uh, our own sample, but we want the same pattern. We want all the same stuff going on. So I'm going to do the exact same thing that I did before, but this time I'm going to do it with the snare. Now, again, I have pre-chopped this so that I can save some time and get to the point because I hate when people spend a whole bunch of time explaining stuff for no reason. But this is now my snare. Um, let me real quick these guys back in so we have it. Oh, that was the wrong one. Let me get rid of this so we don't have to look at it. I make it active. Bring back our other drum loop. Oh, this would be fun. Pro Tools and there we go. All right. So where'd my other drum loop go? Where's the snare? Oh, okay. So my drum loop's right here. So now I have this, let's mute this original. All right, so this is my drum loop that I've set up and it's just the kick drum now, but I need a snare as well. But they're like, hey, keep this vibe of a different feel, but add in a different snare now. So now I can go into my browser. I've already chopped the snare out 
and di in the same process that I did before, where I just duplicated the track, cut out anything that wasn't the snare, and um, now I have in here. I loved. Uh, I always love using uh, the old Super Dead drums from Jake Reed. Uh, shameless plug for Jake. He is. Spent a lot of time recording some cool stuff. But again, this isn't how people are intending to use this most of the time. I think they're really helpful because there's some stuff that I particularly think is great sounding for certain things. So in here, where's my, oh, I'm not soloed. Solo. So I want a, a rim snare. So I'm going to go ahead and throw that in there. And now I have, again, a snare that I can change the tuning of, that I can do whatever I want, that's a rim shot. And now my loop can do something like this instead of what the original loop was doing. So I've now created two drum loops that are exactly the same timing, exactly the same feel and velocity, but have completely different sounds to them. And that's something that's really cool because then I can just do like, okay, so got my got my bass and my guitars down here. Where am I on second? Fly these out. And maybe for the first one, I want it to be that kind of dry thing. And then I want it to come into this uh, drum loop feel. So I get. And now it's going to go over to the other feel. So obviously there's easier ways to do some of this stuff in certain applications. You know, if you're in Ableton or even in Pro Tools at this point, you could convert these into MIDI tracks and then your MIDI, it's like, there's a bunch of ways to skin a cat. And for me, I always like to look at this type of stuff as like, okay, there's, there's a lot of answers to how to solve these problems. I'm not looking for, uh, a thousand different ways, but I need to have a way that works for all the different situations. There's certain things about this that will never be matched by the way you can work in Ableton or the way it's, it's just another trick to get to you to having a lot of answers. All right. So in this same thing, I'm going to show how I do this because you're not limited to just kicks and snares and toms with this. In this situation, I also have a hat pattern. And it's very often that a producer will say to me like, oh, I like the hat pattern, but I hate the sound of the hat. And then it's like, okay, well, what's the best answer to do this fast, you know? And again, if you zoomed in on this hat pattern, you'd find it's not sitting on the grid very often, especially when it gets into the, the, the triplet rolls and stuff like that. It's just not doing what you'd expect it to do Technically, and the reason that it is is I've set it up that way because very purposefully I pulled another hat loop out because this type of stuff happens to me all the time. You go in and you think, well, I'll just, uh, I'll just replace it by putting it on the grid and doing, a, and then the producer's like, it doesn't sound like the original sample. I don't like this. It's not, it's not working. But in this situation with this hat, not only do I get to maintain all the dynamics, I get to. Uh, I, I get to maintain the pattern and the exact way that it's been played, but I also get options. And this is one of my favorite parts about this, because now you can go through, and in this situation, again, I have a whole uh, folder of hats that I keep in here, and I selected a few of them, put them on here, and I have all of these. Now, you'll see here with the tunings, the original samples of these hats, here, I'll play just this one. This one is. It's way too low compared to what the original was. And if I'm trying to keep it in that same register, 
I have the option to just immediately tune it up. So in this case, I went up to like 40, is roughly. And again, I can go and use this mix knob over here to compare. It's still a bit lower, but I'm fine with it because where it's at is fine, but it's cool with me. So this is cool because it gives me the opportunity to both blend something if I like multiples, but also I can preview a bunch of different hats at once. So I can say like, okay, let's try this snap hat first. Or I can try this soft hat. Or I can try the Wonder Girl hat. Or I can blend any combination of these things together. And I can check it with the full loop, which is over here, because I'm a liar. So you're not limited to what the plugin does by itself. That's what's cool about this is there's so many imagination based things that you can come up with on this that you fill in some problems that you or you solve some problems by doing it one way, but maybe the other way is just not working for you. This is something that I can use as just another trick in my bag of tricks that I have to solve a problem whenever that's the issue. And it's cool because there's a lot of other like, you know, you can play with the details, you can go over to the curves, you can change it so it matches the dynamics, you can make it so it's one dynamic, you can do whatever you need to do with any of these to solve the problems, you can tune them, you can whatever. And so um, it's really helpful. And I was the same as most of you probably are where you get this right off the bat and the first thing you think is like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to go through and just use the samples that are in there, but you can load any sample in there. If you wanted to do snaps instead of hats, you could just put the snaps in there. Anything that you want, you can throw into the browser just by navigating to the root folder and adding it in there. As I said, I have, you know, here's just the trigger folders from here to here. All the rest of these are things that I've done on my own. I've curated my own samples. I've created my own stuff to solve specific problems. I've put other hats in there, other kicks in there. I've taken kicks from tracks that were like the situation earlier where I had a bad snare drum that had a bunch of crap in it, and I pivoted to chopping that out, throwing it in here, and now I'm using the original snare, but in its own way. So there's a lot of really cool functionality of this that it's it's just your imagination-based stuff. So I'm going to show you, I think, let me look at my list of things. I think I've done everything. Hats, samples, adding samples. Okay, so I've done everything except for this last trick. And this last trick is truly one of my favorite things to put together. So let's talk about this original drum sample again. This is what we got for this original loop. It's cool, but it's pretty straight. And there's an opportunity here to add some more interesting stuff. So what I'm gonna do uh, the reason that I'm doing this, let's start off with that, is that if I was to add a different snare sample into this, it might do something cool. It might be perfect. It might be exactly what I want, but it also might not do what I want. And so in this situation, what I want is some more feel from this snare pattern without uh, trying to like copy or paste or do anything else like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find this single snare... 
And I'm going to do just what I did earlier with the real snare that I was playing with in the last session, is I'm going to create my own sample out of this. I did the old tab to transient. I'm going to double check it because you can see there's a little bit of crap up front. Chop that off. And I'm going to consolidate this. And then I'm going to export it right into my old Trigger 2 library. Bam. Now, I'm going to create a new track. Now, I'm on a DSP system here, so I have to include this one band in order to use the, the Trigger 2 program after it. If you don't do that, uh, it doesn't allow you to put things in input without bypassing it. So there's a little trick for you if you ever end up in a studio and you only have uh, your standard uh, plugins and you need something that operates on DSP because the native stuff won't work like this. It's a pain in the ass. But this is the little trick is you just throw a DSP plugin that is low resources right in front of it and it will, in theory... Okay, now, oh, I had it bypassed myself. So now you can have it without it being bypassed, right? And all I have is a microphone right here, all right? And once trigger is on here, you don't have to worry about feedback or anything like that. So I can just do this live in the room. And I've added this snare, which is not soloed. So let me. This is the same, same snare from the track. Now, I'm going to do this, and hopefully I don't have the worst rhythm in the entire world because usually I'm good at this. But this is my last little, last little trick that you've probably never seen anybody do before, which I'm going to put this in record. I have a loop record going, and I'm just going to tap on this microphone when I want a ghost note to happen from this snare. Oops, stupid Jeff and his damn thing. Now, the first time I did it was probably the best time, so we'll use that. And this is exactly what I'm going to do, is I would just do it exactly like I did right here, is I'm going to loop this up, and I'm going to use this one time that I did it perfectly, and copy and paste it. And now, our drums have gone from, from this to something with a little bit more flavor with these different uh, ghost notes I've added. And it's just something that you can do to add a little bit more flavor, but now your snare is the same snare. You're not doing something where you're trying to add a snare or match a snare or spend any time. You're using that exact snare that is in that sample. Now I've cranked the gain on this a little bit too much, so there's certainly some room for improvement. And I'm certainly uh, barely doing any extra effort on this. So, uh, But normally you do have to fine tune some stuff and organize it or whatever. But what you get from this is now a sample that has a lot of different feel. You could add drum rolls. You can add uh, you can add any sort of fill that you want, anything that you want. You just have to tap it out, and it's that simple. If you listen to this, Jeff Ellis, who we're in Jeff Ellis's studio right now. Earlier, he was just in the microphone, just saying ridiculous words to trigger the snare each time, and that's that works. You could do anything. It's any noise, and it's just adding more flavor to this track. So we put that all together with everything we've done. And you can do that with any part of the of, of the original drum loop that you want. It's not limited to snares, it's not limited to kicks, it's whatever your imagination tells you. I've done this with uh, putting 808s matching to the kicks, which is also really helpful. A lot of times you'll have a one note 808, you know, it's just a low note and you only want it to happen on certain, you just create, like this is how I would do that if I was gonna do that, is I would duplicate the track like I did before. And then maybe I don't want all of the kicks 
but I want like all the ones, you know, every time it comes back around to a one that it's on the one and I'll just chop out all the rest of them and I'll load in that sample and use it in the exact same way so that it's only hitting on the one. And what's cool about that is again, you are not fighting with the flams. You're not fighting with the placement. You're not fighting with any of this stuff. It is putting it right where that kick is, which is so important with hip hop because a lot of people don't, think about this or don't know about this but when you're dealing with uh samples with kick samples specifically in hip-hop the way that that sample aligns with another low-end sample that phase can cancel out it can cause all sorts of issues like that and it's pretty frustrating sometimes because the first time it hits oh man it sounds great and then the next time it hits it doesn't sound nearly as good and you're like why doesn't it sound good anymore it was because the second time it hits, it's changing its phase relationship with the kick that's there already, and it's not hitting as hard. And so when you do it like this and you add in the samples like this with with Trigger 2, you get the opportunity to uh, make sure that it is hitting every single time the exact same way. And then if there is phase issues, you only have to deal with it one time with the whole track and not a thousand times, which is really helpful. Now, you're still going to do a lot of the same stuff that you have to do before. You're going to have to fly stuff around. And, and a lot of hip hop, especially when it comes to drums, a lot of that stuff is going to be flying stuff around. You're always going to end up flying stuff around. You're always going to have to do a little bit of work. You're going to have to, you know, fine tune the adjustments on things. But the cool thing about it is that, again, you are not going to be fighting with the placement or the phase cohesiveness. It's going to be the same every time it hits, which is really cool. So, uh, again, you're not limited to anything on this except for your own imagination. These are all things I've never seen anybody do these things with Trigger 2. But they're all things that solved a problem in a moment that I was like, dang, I really want to have some ghost notes but I don't want to go in here and pick a different snare. And I don't want to go in here and try and adjust the velocity of this one and move it all around. That's It's a lot of work. It's a lot of crap that isn't necessary to get this done. So I hope that inspired some of y'all for some of these ideas. Uh, I think we're going to pop over and take some questions now. And uh, you guys can let me know what, uh, you know, what, what part of this process is absolutely mind-blowing and what isn't. Cool. Carlos is going to rejoin us now. The man, the myth, the legend. Thank you so much, Greasy. I think that was really insightful. Um, a lot of interesting things came through. Uh, and before we hop into the Q&A session, I just want to let everyone know once again that Trigger 2 right now until March 31st is going to be 20% off at that $99 mark. Uh, you can visit stevenslatedrums.com to learn more. And there's a code we've been dropping in the chat. The code out loud is TriggerGreasy25. And that's also going to be in the chat as well. Um, and, yeah, we'll just roll into some questions. Yeah, let's do it. So first question that we have that came through. So how do you know if your kicks and 808s are hitting hard enough? Do you monitor on different sound systems? Yeah, uh, I don't need to nearly as much anymore. This is like, you know, the different sound system things like that's it's it's certainly helpful. And a lot of times I do like to hear some different, you know, it, I choose my speakers based on what thing I'm working on. If you find me in the studio, like here at East West, they have mains for AT ATCs for mains and then NS10s on the, on, on the board. Those are two dramatically different things. And I use each one for different things. If I want to feel or hear that low end, I'm switching up to the mains and I'm checking it on the mains. And if I want to hear the way that that attack is hitting and make sure that those flams aren't happening, I, I flip to the, the smaller, the NS10s. But uh, no matter what, um, it, it, it is helpful to have that, but I don't need it on my own personal stuff because I'm so used to hearing uh, on my speakers, which I have a pair of these Cali's, uh, Cali Audios at home. I have some Atom A77Xs, which are discontinued and not using anymore. And then I have, um, I have a couple other like, uh, boutique stuff. I, I, all sorts of different speakers, but I've used them enough that I know what is supposed to sound like. It's the same here where if I put a kick drum up on the ATCs, I know what that kick drum is supposed to sound like. I don't need to reference to anything else unless I'm specifically looking for a characteristic that I can't get from the NS10. So I'm not going to hear sub bass on an NS10. So um, yeah, so I 
as you use speakers, you grow accustomed to them, you know them, you get really comfortable with them, you know what things are supposed to sound like on them. And it's the same with headphones. That's actually, I have been playing around with the, the VSX uh, headphones recently, and I find that, you know, if you're starting out, that is something that's probably kind of, I personally have found, it's not, you know, it's not the most useful thing to me because I like my control room. Oops. I like my control room. I like the way things sound. But if you were starting out to have some other references that you don't have, I mean, I got literally seven pairs of speakers in my house that I could use at any time. So I'm not really pressed on it. But if you're starting out and you don't have those many options and you don't really know, it's nice to be able to switch between some different stuff and hear how it would sound in Mike Dean's studio or in the in the Cadillac or whatever, you know? Amazing. Thank you for that. Um, another question we have from Miguel. Uh, he asked, uh, do, do you use the retrigger feature at all? I thought that's where you were going to going with the ghost notes trick at first. So ask him about the retrigger feature. Yeah. Um, it, one of those settings that I talked about earlier that I just already had set up was the retrigger feature. And that's really helpful for some things. And really, you know, it's like if you have, this is one of those things that whenever you're working with trigger, it, it can be a, a little frustrating sometimes before you understand how the parameters work because there's a balance between, uh, I don't know if my screen is still up, but if it is, we'll pull this up real quick. It's a balance between these different parameters over here, the sensitivity, the retrigger, and the detail because sometimes if your sensitivity is too low, it's not picking up all the stuff that you want. Sometimes if your detail is too high, it's not getting the ghost notes. There's all these different things. Uh, and the retrigger can be really helpful for that specific thing because sometimes I need to turn the sensitivity all the way up for something. But when I do that, it's trying to grasp every single transient or every piece of that transient that happens. So the retrigger functionality is really great for that because I can say, like, I don't need anything to happen within 40. In fact, right here, I have it set 41 milliseconds. I don't need something to happen in the first 41 milliseconds after a hit. Like, it's never going to be 41 milliseconds. So I'll turn that up to keep that from happening, but still being able to adjust the sensitivity and the detail to capture the things I want. There's there's not a lot of parameters on this, which is nice. You know, it's like it's nice to not have too many things to deal with, but having those specific ones can be really helpful. So that retrigger and that sensitivity, uh, it, it's a it's a game for each single one to figure out. Okay, I need m it to be more sensitive, but I can't have it do it too fast, or else it's going to sound wrong. Perfect, and thank you for the question, Miguel. Uh, Mark asks, uh, do you always set mix in the trigger to a hundred percent? Uh, I don't always. It really depends. Sometimes, uh, for me personally, whenever I'm doing like live drums, which is, uh, I know we talked about this being for hip hop and everything, but uh, I, you know, I came up in studios like live drums were my thing for years. Like I, I almost. Uh, in fact, there was a joke whenever I first was going through school, like never say you hate working on something because that's the only thing you'll ever do. And and I used to always say I hated working on hip hop because I didn't get to do as much. I didn't get to flex my creative muscles and like do. A, and that was really that was newbie sighted of me to not realize there's so many ways to engineer in hip hop. It's just it gets relegated to the simplest thing a lot of times because that's what everybody else knows. But for me personally, like I. Um, I do things on live drums a lot of times and still do a ton of live drum tracking. So in in the situation of the mix, I could sometimes put a snare track up and mix the new drum that I have that I'm layering that snare drum with. And then other times I might do a duplicate track and do a 100% mix. It really is always condition-based. And that's, again, one of the really cool things is not a lot of parameters, not a lot of things that you have to mess with, but you can mess with a lot of things. So in this situation, uh, I was talking about it mostly with like the hats that I did. With the hats, it's really cool because maybe I want a little bit of that original hat that's going on. Maybe I don't want any of that hat and I can blend back and forth. So the mix for me typically stays at 100, but sometimes, sometimes I just want to hear that it's hitting at the same time as the original, even though I'm replacing it. Sometimes, and that's just helpful to just hear. Sometimes the mix knob's helpful because I do want to blend some of that original thing in. Sometimes it's, sometimes with like real snares, I want to blend some of that original in because I like what's happening with the blend, but 
there's no way for me to accurately get those little ghost notes in without getting the other stuff going on. And it's nice to be able to get the original snares ghost notes and and then rely on Slate for the the big hits. You know, there's a lot of options with it. So for me, it is all about what is right in the moment. You know, it's like what is going to solve my problem for this thing, not not I do it this way. Very interesting. It seems like it's a case by case scenario Always. basis. Yes. Always. Uh, that kind of comes to the next question. Uh, Cody has a question. Um, can, can you explain the dynamic section of the plugin more? It's it's uh, it's an aspect I had no clue about, and it seems like a game changer. So they're asking about the dynamic section of the plugin. I can't. <laughs> no. Um. It, literally, in coming up with this, is something that I've. You know, I'm a I'm a plugin clicker. The first thing I'm gonna do whenever I get a new plugin is go through and find out what I can do. And there is some really cool stuff with this that I did not know was there until I delved into this. Like, you can change the attack of that sample that you're loading in. You can change the sustain and the release. It doesn't, as far as I can tell, does not add the sustain or release but whatever's there if you were using say an 808 but you wanted to program that 808 to come off quicker you can just click on these different parameters and you can adjust all those things just like you could with a normal you know like with a normal synth where it's like i want to make this i want to cut it off this far i want it to trail this far and it's really helpful the dynamics and the velocity are two things i literally before this even started thought I, I'm not 100% sure on this because I don't fully know. And I, I, I am going to delve into that because I hate not knowing things. It drives me insane when I don't fully know. But the combination of the dynamics and the velocity whenever you're working with these uh, will change the way that your dynamics work. And sometimes what's really cool, they have this range minimum and range maximum, which is something I use a lot whenever I say like, hey, look, Maybe it's only getting this much of a signal. It's a tiny little thing, but I always want it to fall between this far and this far. And that's that's how it makes it almost like MIDI whenever you're working with that stuff. So I don't fully know uh, the dynamics and the velocity and how they work and what it is. I just know that I have to play with them every single time to be like, hey, I'm not getting dynamics or I'm getting too much dynamics and I go back and mess with it. So uh that is something I would actually uh, request because it is something that uh, even leading up to this, I look for the information. And, and again, when you get into these secret like menus and stuff, you know, like there's not always the Internet's so tough for finding answers for stuff. Sometimes even whenever you like Google stuff or you like specifically words that you're like trying to get, sometimes you'll get some like gear space article from 10 years ago where some guy is just ranting and you're trying to like read through a bunch so that is actually specifically the dynamics and the velocity i'd love to hear from something from 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 slate in the future about this because uh i i would like to know exactly how to control it but i know that typically i turn it on i play with it a little bit and then i get it right so uh 90 percent of my problems are typically solved by just Let's open it up. Let's play with it. It's gonna. I'm gonna either hear it or I'm not. And if I don't hear it, then I'm gonna fix it. So, uh, so yeah. Open that uh, view curves up and play with that. Thank you, Greasy, for that and um, the transparency there. Uh, we have another question that came through from Jake, um, and Jake is asking: um, Being able to control the sensitivity with trigger, are you less concerned with cymbal bleed for live drum tr uh, mic tracks such as kick and snare? So that's a great question because uh, people ask me this all the time, especially when it comes like people will always ask about bleed. And there's a lot of things. Now, when I'm doing my own stuff, I, I typically I know that I recorded things the way that I recorded. I know why I did things that I did. But I get tracks from people all the time that recorded, uh, you know, drums, maybe by themselves, maybe with an engineer who's not great, whatever. And there's all sorts of things to solve inside of that. So for me personally, the first step is whenever I'm miking, I'm placing microphones to already reject as much bleed from cymbals, other toms, whatever. So if I have a snare drum, if there's bleed in those tracks that I'm trying to deal with, it, the snare drum is going to be the most prominent signal in there, and that bleed is going to be very minimal. So you can use that 
to your advantage in those certain situations. Now, there's other times, and I'm sure we've all dealt with this, where it's like the tom signal is just as heavy in the snare drum as it is in the as, as it is in, in you know in the tom. You know, it's like the snare and the tom in the snare mic are the same level the whole time, and that can be really frustrating whenever you're dealing with like the sensitivity and stuff like that because it doesn't work, and that's not a flaw of trigger as much as it is a flaw of engineering before you even got to it so those are those times whenever you're like man i gotta figure it now some of the tricks that i do to solve that before i even get there is i might um i might load up a gate that is triggered frequency you know like so i'm only gating out the real low end of something so it's going to get that tom out or i'm only gating out what's essentially the really high end which is like a symbol so whenever it gates that high end out it makes that signal of that snare more prominent and in that same thing so then i can worry about triggering from that because it's triggering off of the the uh snare more than anything else now there's always going to be a little bit of you know fudging with stuff because you have to you know it's like you're always going to face different problems that's one of the most annoying things it's like whenever i get something that i didn't record it's like how do i fix this thing and it's like sometimes this is the answer and sometimes it's the best answer sometimes it's not the answer and sometimes you got to like play with stuff to get this to be the answer and and that's just engineering that's the whole thing it's like you don't as an engineer, as a mixer, you don't get to work on what you want to work. You work on what you have to work. You don't get the microphones that you want until you get to the highest level, yeah. you know. You get the microphones you have. You don't get the tracks that you want. You get the tracks that you have. And yeah. so you deal with those problems individually each time. And that's something that I find that this is why it's, you know, I was so willing. Everybody that knows me knows I don't do advertising i don't do stuff this is stuff that i'd been making videos on already and showing people hey there's more to this than just i'm layering samples and like people will always every single time i post real drums and i go through a mic thing on, on my tiktok people will come on and be like all that just to replace the you know, just yeah. to sample replace everything and it's like well no you do that because like you don't know any better or you're not at that level I don't have to do that because I'm already good. But sometimes I do find myself at the end where I'm like, dang, I recorded 10 drum tracks in a day all through. And like this one song, the snare's just not cutting through. So it's like, all right, well, now it's a solution. It's not a, a crutch. It's a solution. It's a solution to a problem in a mix that I need to solve. So all of these things, they're just little pieces of things that you can throw in your tool bag and be like, hey, this is an idea for the next time I get into this situation, you know? Thank you for that. Uh, and I have a couple more questions for you. Um, looks like we have some questions coming in. Uh, is there a mistake you hear most often when you get hip hop tracks from other engineers? Like what one or two pieces of wisdom would you pass on to all of us so we don't make a mix engineers work harder? That's a good one. Yeah. Um, I get different mistakes from everybody. I get a lot of different options on that kind of stuff, but I'd say, um, uh, I'd say really actually one of the biggest issues that I come across with uh, with hip hop is people thinking that they have that there's a right way to do things. So somebody will send me a track and I'll hear the reference that they sent me before and I'll be like, this doesn't sound the same. Like, why is it different? And then I go in and I start, you know, I can. I've been doing this long enough that like I can kind of like follow forensic trails through the whole thing. I can see like, oh, you did this here and then you did this there. And then you thought I was going to get mad about you throwing sound good eyes on here. So you pulled that off or you printed it or you did something to hide it from me. Or you were thinking that like there isn't wrong things. If you were making that track and you got to a point with that track that the artist was like, yes, I love that, you know. You don't need to like hide it from me, you know. You don't have to like change things because the real truth is I'm going to get that track and I'm going to listen to the way that you had it and then I'm going to do something that's a little fucked just to get it back to where you had it yeah. because because that's the one thing and it, this was um this was actually a game changer for me because I was working with No ID on a record about a decade ago almost already. Uh yeah, like 7 8, eight years ago I think. And um, I was I was going through and I was being a, a young engineer that 
knows his stuff and like you know and like i would get something in from somebody and i'd go through and i'd fix stuff i'd fix these things that were like oh man you're slamming in the red on this kick drum you're slamming in the red on this snare drum like you guys this gain staging's all wrong and i'd start fixing it and then and then every single time no i'd be no idea would be like what are you doing bro like why are why are you doing that he's like these kids that are making this stuff this is punk rock to them this is this is, I don't know rules. They don't know rules. You're competing against engineers that don't know rules. Why are you putting rules into this situation? And I always thought that was like, to me suddenly, like it, it blew my mind to think like, nah, dude, like you're not here to, to like make things right all the time. And like, as an engineer, you don't have to pass stuff off to mixers being like, oh, I, I, I made this correct now so that you don't have to. No, do what you were doing. Yeah. Turn that track up to plus 12, yeah. you know, put a limiter on everything. Yeah. If that's what was making people happy, yeah. it's not my job to go back and be like, you're not an engineer. You're, no, you're doing this all wrong. It's my job to make what you did work. Yeah. It's my job to go and look at your stuff. Now, sometimes it was wrong and it's not going to work. But a lot of the times, that's what's cool about rap specifically is rap is today's punk music. Yeah. Rap is today's like bunch of kids getting a laptop. The kid that's the engineer is the only one that was willing to spend the money on Pro Tools. You know, the kid that's the engineer does not. I've taken over on dozens of sessions where people had like the homie recording them before I got there. And and I'm like looking at you know, a bunch of like 60 plugins on every track. And it's like, oh, you know, and like, I can't record on a track because it's like, there's so much latency and all that stuff. And then I go through thinking I'm going to fix it and like make it better and everything. And it doesn't sound the same. It's not the yeah. same feel. It doesn't have that punk feel to what's going on. That's that SoundCloud era. That's yeah. that, that's that era of we don't know what we're doing, yeah. but we just make it sound cool. Yeah. And that goes back to something I tell people all the time. Like my friend, Mr. Hudson, who uh, worked on, uh, you know, uh, uh, 808 and Heartbreaks with, with Kanye yeah. and who worked on, uh, who did uh, uh, that song with, with Jay-Z, the yeah. Forever Young song and all that stuff. He, he, one time we were talking in the studio and he was like, he was like, man, I, I, I don't know. Like I want to, I want to get into mixing, but I don't know about EQs and I don't know about like, I, you know, like, like fancy, you know, like mid side yeah. stuff and all that stuff. And I was like, bro, just start mixing. You, you know, it's once you're at that level, you're not mixing for a scientist. You're not mixing for other mixing mixers. You're mixing on opinion. That's just an opinion. And if you think it sounds cool and it sounds good, it is cool and it is good. So, uh, so to circle that all back to the original question, it's like don't don't think you got to do something to make it correct. If you are if you are clip gaining the track up till it's just crunchy as hell, and that's what sounds good for the thing, just do that. Don't don't try and pretend or or fix something for somebody else's benefit. Just do what sounds cool and what sounds right, and you will find so much more happiness in your mixes than whenever you're over here trying to be like, but it's not correct and it's not, you know, yeah, yeah. It's like, just do what sounds cool. It doesn't matter. Really appreciate that one. I know I watched one of your TikToks and you kind of expressed that, like, you know, basically the speed at which people are producing projects that they're passionate about. You know what I mean? They're not thinking about the rules. They're just making it happen and the consumers are like really soaking it in. Right. Um, so we got two more two more questions. One's not even a question. This is a, a phrase that came through. So Robin Z says the world needs a greasy wheel trigger sample pack. How do you feel about that? Yeah, um, I, I definitely think so. I think that um, one of the things about this that we you know, when we first talked about this at, at NAM this year, uh, the, the whole concept is that people think of trigger as being a rock thing. They think that this is. That it's like, oh, you just use this on on whenever you're recording drums and you don't have a good drum recording. And it's like there is so many functional ways of using this and so many ways to put things together. And I have always created my own drums for stuff like I I will sample something I have. I mean, I have a huge collection of drum machines. I have a Lindrum. I have a TR8. I have like all the OG stuff. Like I have all the new stuff. And I'm always like, anytime I create a kick drum or a snare or a hat or anything that I like, throw it in the pack, throw it in the pack. So I think it would be really cool to 
bring people over to this side of things and like and uh and and get people to understand that this is just another tool it's another tool that can add some cool functionality to your beats it can add some cool sounds to your beats and it doesn't just have to be a rock and roll thing it doesn't just have to be for old heads that are like you know doing their drum shit it can be for any style of music you can create anything so yeah so go over to that steven slate instagram page and start release the greasy pack you know so i can i can extort some more money out of these guys you know Thank you so much. Um, and the last last question we have for you, uh, Killer Mike, uh, kind of central question. Did Killer Mike already have the concept for Michael worked out when he started working with you, or did it emerge as you guys were working on you know something of an album, or were you guys working on a couple songs and it became an album? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think that, I mean, Mike knew right from the jump that he was uh, doing something for him you know that was the important part because it was like uh when we first talked about it he had said like hey you know to to l to lp like hey l like uh I i'm gonna do a project on my own and i need you to know it's like it's just because i can't say these things and speak this way to people on run the this isn't run the jewel stuff and he had specifically said like i am making an album to speak to the black community yeah. you know and like that was something that was always on his mind while we were creating this album is like this is a conversation for the black community and if white people get it and understand it and like it that's awesome but i'm talking to black people right now and and you can hear that that is that is distinctly the theme throughout the album for sure and the other part of that was like i want this to feel like the south i want this to feel like atlanta and a lot of that was reflected in the things that we were having to do like like i'm showing here with like these because like you know, you get into that Memphis sound, you get into that Atlanta sound, it's sloppy. It's it's intentionally sloppy. Yeah. You know, it is a muddy. sloppy, muddy yeah. sound. And you can't just go in there and start quantizing Clean things and up, cleaning uh, stuff up. It's not going to feel yeah. like, like an Atlanta record. But when you listen to that record, it feels like Atlanta. Yeah. It feels like a hot summer day with the humidity out the ass. You know, yeah. it's like it's hot. And so... One of the things that I was very adamant about while I was doing this was to maintain the integrity of these songs, to keep them feeling that way. But you, you know, but like also still make it, you know, an album that that can stand on its own and have the quality that it has, you know. So there is a ton of live stuff on that record. We we made it specifically. So, I mean, the way that this album started, I'll just give a quick run through of it because it's a great story. Uh the way that this album started is Mike basically had a beat from a producer yeah. and it would be the standard way you get beats in this industry. It's like it's it's like a four bar intro, eight bar, eight bar, eight bar, eight bar, eight. Bar, eight bar. You know, it's like it's you might get a bunch of different stuff, but it is just one. Yeah, it's just it's just a bunch of different eight bar sections. And so when we got that, it it, it they were cool. They sounded great, but they had no you know it, it had no you know like uh dynamics it had no you know like hey this is the chorus and it's gonna come up here and this is gonna be the outro and this is gonna be the intro it was all just a bunch of two track loops so what we ended up doing was and this was a no id thing this is very common for no id is he brings in real musicians to play on top of what we have so we would have these loops and we would have these parts and sometimes i had the stems sometimes i didn't yeah. You know, sometimes it's just this is the track we got. And so um, and so for me, the the goal was to get these musicians, these live musicians, bring them into the studio, record them, add those instruments into these tracks without ruining what the feel was originally. You know, and that was really, uh, really important to the way that this album eventually came out, because we didn't do a lot of micro editing on these on these things. Like normally, if you. If you ask me to do a record, now, of course, it's like dependent on the style and the genre and everything. But typically, I'm going to try and make things a, a level of perfect. You know, it's like I want things. I am an engineer. I am, you know, the person who tweaked for 17 hours, like perfectly <laughs> quantizing drums one yeah. time, only to realize that I hated the way that perfectly quantized drums okay. sound, you know. And 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 I, I always talk about this because this is a, a thing that almost all engineers and producers go for, for is like you start off and you're not very good and you're not making very good stuff. And so you start 
going up the chain of like, okay, well, I'll get a better microphone. I'll get a better thing. I'll get loop packs. I'll get better drum sounds. I'll get all this stuff. And you keep going towards perfect and perfect and perfect. And then at some point in time, you get to perfect and you're like, oh, I hate everything about this. Let's go back, you know? And, um, and that was kind of a little bit of the process with the, with, with Killer Mike's album is that we would find these times where it was like, like, Hey, we made this too nice. This is too pretty. It's too neat. Let's go back. And specifically on um on talking that shit, we we got the two track uh originally from from uh DJ Paul from from 36. Uh and then he had done some stuff like just in his computer and on the track itself that I couldn't replicate. I couldn't make it sound the way he had it. Like it was just even when we got the splits, they didn't add up to that two track. And yeah. so there's parts in that song that are the original two track still yeah. because it was like, man, we're not it it we're not it, it just yeah, it doesn't sound as greasy as that does. It doesn't sound as slimy and just doesn't have that feel that made it feel this way. I think we should just go back to the two track on this. And we did a lot of that because, you know, maintaining at the end of the day, as much as I love fixing stuff, as much as I love having tricks, and to, at the end of the day, it's all about the feel. It's all the feel of the way that that music feels. And if you do too much, if you fix too much, you make it too perfect, you make it too drum samples, you make it too much, it doesn't feel right and it doesn't feel legitimate. And so we went through that and we chose our times to be perfect. We chose our times to replace stuff. We chose our times to put stuff on top of stuff. We chose our time to record a real choir, you know? Yeah. And then even with that real choir, we recorded it here at East West. We didn't have a studio to record it uh, at the day that it was there. It was like we were in Studio 5, which doesn't have a big enough live room yeah. for 15 people to come in. Mm -hmm. We stuck them in the lounge upstairs, and I just threw microphones up. And at the end of some of those songs, you can hear when it's just choir going. You can hear the 808 bleed through the floor because we were downstairs just cranking it. Yeah, I could have done some EQ to fix that. I could have chopped some stuff out. It was cool. Yeah. It felt a way just leave it and there was a lot of that stuff so uh you know it's important to to have that knowledge of that process and know when you should fix stuff know when you should be leaving things greasy know when you should like get it like you know a as clean as possible and let that juxtaposition do its thing in the song itself so it was a great process it was a great record and honestly uh for me it was like it, it was one of the things i'm most proud of because Mike's not a control freak. He's used to working with L who yeah. does the control freak stuff, yeah. who gets nitty gritty on stuff. And so Mike was leaning back to me and uh, Cuz Lightyear, who was the A&R on this, and a true A&R. I, I hate that term A&R for him because he was a true A&R. He was in the studio every day. We were there till 5 a.m. sometimes working on stuff. And he would be like, you know, he would come up with an idea. And it would be so abstract and crazy like, Man, I want it to sound like seagulls flying over the ocean at 3 a.m., you know? And it's like, then I'd be like over there, like tweaking on stuff. And we sculpted this album, but I got to be an engineer and a producer and a, like an idea guy. And nothing I said or did was ever turned away without having heard it, you know? People would hear it. And a really great story on that same tip is when we were doing the, the Andre 3000 song, uh, people... When we got it, it was not what it became. It started with just a single, that single loop that's underneath uh, Stacks while he's rapping. That was it. That was all we had was just that arpeggiated loop. And that was it. And when we sent an early version to him, he wasn't into it. He didn't. And then me and Cuz spent two days just going to town on that, like, Cutting parts out, moving stuff around, chopping stuff, putting different beats in places. That has three different producers on it. You know, it's got um, No ID, it's got DJ Paul, and it's got James Blake doing stuff on there. And, like, different, you know, Futures on there. We got Aaron Allen Kane. All those things were, like, we had to chop those up. We had to move them around. We had to fit them into place. We had to do all this stuff. And Stax has originally said, no, nah, I, don't, I don't want this to come out. I'm not really, I think it sounds like, like an incomplete thought. And then he heard what we had done to it. And we're like, wait, 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 have you heard the most recent version? And then he heard, when he heard that re that most recent version, he was like, yo, this is amazing. I'm in. You guys you guys can release this. And so I changed I changed Stack's mind with doing that stuff. You know? And that was like a big moment for me where I was like, damn, they believe in me enough to, to 
to go back to him and be like, hey, man, wait a second. Yeah. Like, we think this is bigger than you think it is. So, yeah, um, really proud of that record. Really proud of the engineering on that record. The blend of the production and the engineering. The blend of this sloppy, mean-sounding street shit with, like, some cleaned-up stuff, some gospel choirs. Like, all this stuff really came together. So, fun album to make. Thank you so much for that story and uh, that insight. And uh, at that point, we're going to wrap it up. Uh, Greasy, really appreciate you. Uh, congratulations on the Grammy wins. And, uh, you know, thank you for, you know, letting uh, Trigger be a part of that. You know what I mean? I think that's Absolutely. very, very amazing. Yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, first off, again, thank everybody uh, for coming out and listening to this. I know a lot of you follow me from the different social medias and you see the stuff that I'm out here doing and the bigger goal of what we're trying to do. And uh, this is the first time that I've done any like real like, you know, corporate side shit. And I I enjoy doing this because I think that um, I think that one of the problems that we have today is we're all kind of stuck in this, like what social media is and how it's being used to like sell stuff and push stuff. I think there's room for both things in this world. And and if you aren't already following me, I, I, I encourage you to come and check me out on the on TikTok or on Instagram and see the stuff that I'm doing, because uh there is cool stuff to be said about this. There's yeah. cool things to be done here, and it doesn't just have to be, you know, like the standard, like, here's yeah. the five tips you didn't know and yeah, stuff yeah, like yeah. that. There's cool stuff to be said and done about this, and 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 the more of this we get to do, this is really fun for me because I don't have to compromise my morals or, like, pretend I don't like this software. I love this software. I use it all the time when it's necessary. Yeah. And that's a really thing. Same thing with, like, I was talking about the VSX stuff before, like, that's I'm I don't get paid for that, you know, Steven, what up? You know, but the point is like I can recognize when something is valuable to yeah. people and I'm not out here to try and like sell things to people. That's y'all's job. Y'all yeah. sell the shit to them. I'm here to show you that there's some cool applications yeah. to use for this stuff that's that's really the you know, like interesting and yeah. useful for what you're doing and Y'all selling the stuff. And then I'll just keep talking shit on TikTok and doing my thing. So thanks again, everybody. I appreciate y'all coming out and watching this. Uh, everybody that watches it in the replay, sorry that you didn't get to ask questions. But I'm super open on TikTok. People can hit me. I answer almost all my comments, even the haters, because I like that. I think it's fun. I like the haters. I like haters. They're funny. You know? Yeah. Like, bro, I got a Grammy. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So thanks again. Uh, appreciate y'all checking this out. Follow me wherever um, and ask your questions if you have them because I'm open book on it. Yes. And before we cut out, I just want to let everyone know once again that it's on, it's on sale. $99 right now. Uh, we've dropped the code in the chat. It'll still come through the chat. Um, but go ahead and grab Trigger 2 and you can use so, some of the cool things that we've seen Greasy do. Um, you know, it's available for you at a discounted price right now. Yeah, and if you come up with some new stuff, make a TikTok. Make a TikTok, show me, because I'm always looking for new stuff. And if you figure out the dynamic and velocity buttons, uh, I could also use that, too. <laughs> Thank you so much, Greasy, again. And then we're going to cut to uh, a video also to showcase our SSD and Trigger 3, some upcoming things with the AI there for SSD and then our Trigger 3 uh, interface. So thank you guys very much. We really appreciate it. You have a good night.